In 2008, during my lecture tour in Australia, I met a very large, very black, and very friendly female Lord Howe's Island stick insect. She crawled from one of my hands to the other several times, and when I gave her the opportunity, she also crawled onto my head and face. The encounter sent shivers up my spine, knowing as I did the almost incredible story of how she came to be there. Lord Howe's Island, small and partly covered with lush forest, is about 300 miles off the coast of New South Wales, Australia. It was the only known home of the Lord Howe's Island phasmid, or stick insect, or walking stick, a giant creature about the size of a large cigar, four or five inches long and half an inch wide. Once, they were found throughout the forests of the island and known by the locals as land lobsters. But in 1918, black rats arrived on the island when a ship was wrecked. And as always, these relentless colonists quickly adapted to their new environment. Unlike all other stick insects in Australia, this giant phasmid lacked wings. And so it was an easy and probably delicious prey. At some point in the 1920s, the Lord Howe's Island phasmid was presumed extinct. It might seem strange that one of the greatest conservation success stories could begin with an extinction, but the Lord Howe Island stick insect is an animal that came back from the dead. Before the rats arrived in 1918, they were so common on the island that locals used them as fishing bait, but in just a few years, they had vanished. By 1961, it was reported that no one in the area had seen one for 30 to 40 years, and not a single child at the local school had even heard of them. The shipwrecked rats seem to have done a tragically thorough job of totally eradicating this weird walking cigar from the face of the earth, and almost entirely from living memory, too. So how did one end up crawling on Dr. Jane Goodall's face in 2008? Well. Even though we had consigned this unique insect to the history books, it had somehow managed to stick around, but just barely. And the story of its incredible rediscovery and the recovery that followed shows us that conservation sometimes relies on both effort and luck just to find the last living member of a species, let alone protect them. But it also shows us that sometimes conservation requires difficult ethical choices too. Like what happens when saving one animal means killing another. The rediscovery of Dryocasilis australis began completely by accident in the strangest of places. In 1964, a team of climbers visited a rocky outcrop called Ball's Pyramid, an almost inaccessible volcanic spire jutting 500 meters out of the ocean, over 20 kilometers off the coast of Lord Howe Island. There, they reportedly stumbled on the recently dead remains of a single large insect matching the description of Dryocasilis. It seemed absurd that a population of these forest-loving land lobsters could have somehow made it all the way to the pyramid and held out in such a desolate environment for decades after all the others had died out. But in 2001, a team of researchers on a scientific expedition to the outcrop eventually managed to track down and confirm the existence of a final endling population there, becoming the first people to see a living Dryocasilis in around 80 years. The insects were found to be living on a lone tea tree bush nestled in a crevice 100 meters above the shoreline. This single castaway population living on the rat-free pyramid numbered only two dozen individuals, making them perhaps the rarest insects in the world. How exactly these giant flightless stick insects crossed 23 kilometers of ocean to establish a lone isolated population on the pyramid in the first place is a mystery. Maybe they floated there from Lord Howe Island on a raft of vegetation during a storm? Or maybe an egg-carrying female was mistaken for a stick, picked up by a seabird, and dropped into a nest on the pyramid. We may never know for sure, but their dramatic rediscovery seemed almost too good to be true. A bizarre and unique animal hanging on in a single remote wilderness long after we thought it was gone. It's the exact kind of rediscovery scenario that people desperately dream of happening for so many other charismatic extinct species, no matter how unlikely, from thylacines in Tasmania to plesiosaurs in Loch Ness. But it rarely works out that way. Extinction is usually forever. The few exceptions that do reappear after being declared extinct are given the title of Lazarus taxa, species that came back from the dead. 
The most famous of these is probably the coelacanth, a fish that we thought had been gone for more than 60 million years before a live one was caught in 1938. Lazarus taxa really show us the limits of our definitions when it comes to extinction. We can never fully prove the absence of something after all, so while extinction is obviously a real thing that happens, it can be very tricky to pinpoint, which can be a problem. Because whether or not a species is considered officially extinct has important implications for how we manage ecosystems, fund conservation programs, and view the world around us. The simplest definition of the moment of extinction is the death of the last known individual, the endling. Then, as far as we know, they're extinct. But depending on the circumstances, that might not mean much. Maybe we just haven't looked very hard in the wild, or they're notoriously difficult to spot. So another guideline that's sometimes been used historically is the 50-year rule, declaring a species extinct only when 50 years have passed since the last confirmed sighting, giving any remaining survivors a chance to show up before calling time. But this is still a pretty arbitrary, one-size-fits-all approach to extinction. It doesn't take into account different factors in different situations. Most recently, a more species-specific guideline has been adopted that relies on the principle of reasonable doubt. It requires exhaustive surveys of a species' known and expected habitat to have come up empty-handed before a declaration of extinction can be made. It's an improvement, but reasonable doubt can still be a pretty subjective measure. It might not have been reasonable to doubt the extinction of the coelacanth after a gap of more than 60 million years, but there it was, unreasonably alive. And it might not have seemed reasonable to search Ball's Pyramid for Dryocoselis before declaring it extinct. The rocky ocean outcrop was definitely not in the insect's known or expected habitat. While they challenge our definitions of extinction, the rediscovery of Lazarus taxa is always cause for celebration. But when that surviving population of Dryocoselis was found, joy quickly turned to panic. This last small group was on the edge of a cliff, both figuratively and literally. Just one chance event, say a rock slide, could easily re-extinct the species at any moment, and this time for good. We'd already lost the species once, we couldn't risk it happening again. So, in 2003, scientists returned to the pyramid and collected two males and two females with the aim of establishing a managed captive population on the Australian mainland. The captives began as just an insurance policy against a disaster hitting the last wild group on the pyramid. But over the years, they've enabled more than just the continued survival of the species. They've also made their eventual recovery in the wild a possibility, too. See, the captive Dracocelis went on to found a healthy, growing population of thousands of individuals in multiple zoos around the world. It's definitely a step up from clinging to a single precarious cliffside bush or being technically extinct. But one last obstacle has remained in the way of them returning to their former home of Lord Howe Island and achieving a true recovery, those pesky rats. See, it's one thing to rediscover a species and breed it in large numbers, but if its natural habitat can no longer support it, then it'll only ever be a zoological curiosity, kept alive and cared for by us humans in captivity. And as long as Lord Howe Island remains full of rats, it doesn't matter how many thousands of captive Dryocoselis we could drop back into the wild. They'd all just be swiftly gobbled up, just like last time. So in 2009, the island's board, the local government body responsible for managing the area's affairs, proposed a large-scale rodent eradication campaign. One that involved dropping 42 tons of poisoned bait across the Lord Howe Island chain over just 100 days or so. The aim was to completely wipe out every last rodent from the area, allowing native species like Dryocoselis to thrive there once again. Understandably, some people were not into this idea. Spreading pesticide across an ecosystem to kill off entire animal populations feels like the exact opposite of what conservationists should be doing. And when you start trying to rank species by value, you quickly run into thorny ethical conundrums. Like, is it ever fair to categorize species simply as despised invaders versus cherished natives? Can extermination truly count as conservation? And do all of those rodents really deserve to suffer and die just for the crime of existing, when we're the reason they're there in the first place? Plus, many locals on the island worried about the long-term health and environmental effects of the proposal. What if the poison also affected non-target species and backfired ecologically? 
And some even simply disliked the idea of a huge, weird bug being introduced into their daily life. Mice and rats might actually be preferable to live around compared to land lobsters. But the arguments in favor of eradicating the rodents were also hard to ignore. The invasive mice and rats had been devastating to Lord Howe Island's unique ecology, to Dryocosilus most famously, but also to other species. At least five bird and 13 invertebrate species had been lost to the rats already, and many other animals had become critically endangered. It would seem like eliminating populations of common species to protect the survival of endangered ones is logical and justifiable if the goal of conservation is preventing extinction wherever possible. And especially if humans caused the problem in the first place, as we did on Lord Howe Island by bringing the rodents over accidentally. The debate proved pretty divisive among the island's residents, and a 2015 poll on the eradication proposal saw it win by a slim 52 to 48 percent majority. Four years and two legal challenges later, the $16 million project was officially launched, and poison cereal bait was distributed by hand and airdropped by helicopter across nearly the entire Lord Howe Island chain. That killer cereal proved to be a pretty effective cereal killer. By late 2023, Lord Howe Island was officially declared rodent-free. And early data suggests that many of the island's native plant, invertebrate, and ground-nesting bird species are already showing rapid signs of recovery now that they, their seeds, and their eggs aren't being devoured by rodents. Soon, Dryocosilus may finally rejoin them there, too. Giving these land lobsters a second chance at survival has meant making some tough, expensive, and controversial decisions. And while the ethics of killing to save are still up for debate, from a purely practical perspective, the approach seems to have worked. More than a century after we thought it had gone extinct, and over 60 years since its unlikely rediscovery, the stage might finally be set for Dryocosilus to make one of the greatest ecological comebacks of all time. Endlings was filmed in the Harry Plumley studio and was made possible by hundreds of you who supported our Kickstarter. Thank you so very much. We really could not have done this without you. We wanted to give some special thanks to the National Geographic Photo Arc and the San Diego Zoo for letting us use their images in this episode. Finding images of these animals is not easy, so we really appreciate the ability to work with them to show these animals to you. Yeah.